there are so many different angles we can use and we always find the evidence for the existence of black holes. But one thing that's important about them is that they're utterly different. The black hole singularities are completely wild and crazy. I'm going to try to understand how these things appear in the universe, what role they have, and most importantly for someone like me, what they teach us about the fundamental laws of physics. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Black Hole Paradox. Astronomers last year claimed to have achieved what was thought impossible and captured an image of a black hole, seemingly proving the existence of these most mysterious objects. Yet not everyone is convinced Black holes are so described because they were proposed as a space from which nothing could escape, not even light. At the heart of the black hole, physics seemed to come to an end, its normal laws in tatters. Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking were amongst the first to propose black holes. But at the end of Hawking's life, even he came to doubt their existence, at least in the sense in which they were first described. But can we really doubt something that was predicted not only by relativity, but by quantum mechanics as well? Should we try to hold on to our idea of black holes, however mysterious and not yet understood that they are? To get to the bottom of what they really mean, we have Sean Carroll, theoretical physicist and research professor at the California Institute of Technology. Roger Penrose, the mathematical physicist and emeritus professor of mathematics at Oxford. And we have Emily Saint-Ange, professor of astrophysics at UCL. What is it makes each of you believe so strongly in something that we um, can't see? Emily, do you, want to, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm coming at this from an astrophysics perspective. You said I'm an observer. My job is to you know, use big telescopes and look at what's out there in space and try to piece together a story for how the universe you know, came to be and evolve into what it is today. And almost anywhere we look, we find evidence for things that we can't see, but we can see their distinct signatures. If we looked at, towards the center of almost every single galaxy, we can see motions of stars and gas that seem to orbit at very fast speed around something that yet we can't see. Um, and that is some, people might say indirect evidence, but still some evidence for the existence of black holes. Then if we look elsewhere in our galaxy, we see stars that seem to shine so brightly. And that's because they are you know, giant stars orbiting around a, a, comp a companion that's a black hole and some very high energy uh, processes happening there. So I think like in science, when you're thinking about a complex problem, what you do is you approach it from all sorts of different angles. And in this case, there are so many different angles we can use and we always find the evidence for the existence of black holes. Thank you, Emily. Sean, why do you believe in these things so strongly? It's a great question. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was actually an astronomy major in an astronomy department, despite the fact that, you know, by inclination, I'm more of a physicist. And I became extremely impressed by the fact that astronomers could collect little tiny bits of data, like the tiny fluctuations in the light output of a star. And spin these elaborate tales about what was going on. You know, we have a star that is pulsating and it's being orbited by a disk that is tilted. And it seemed like getting something for nothing. But what you realize is that physics and astrophysics are very unforgiving. We're given a theory by Einstein, the general theory of relativity from a hundred so years ago, and it makes these predictions and you can test them against what you see in a variety of ways. And that's the crucial thing. It's not just that we do one thing and we say, yes, we're on the right track, but we do our many little things. We do what Amelie already mentioned. We look at the centers of galaxies. You can see stars orbiting something, something that is very, very massive and very, very small and very, very dark. It fits exactly what you would think a supermassive black hole would look like, but you know, maybe it could be something else. But then you look at other binary stars where there's stuff accreting onto some invisible companion and giving off high energy radiation. Again, exactly what a black hole would look like, but in a very different regime. And then you look at gravitational waves, which we just found a few years ago, which turn out to be exactly what Einstein would have predicted over 100 years ago on the basis of his, his equation if you had two very massive black holes spiraling into each other. 
So there's this give and take between theory and observation. And the theory is very unforgiving. It predicts very, very certain things. And you see those things over and over again in different circumstances. And you eventually go, you know, I'm never 100% sure. That's not how science works. But I become more and more sure. And at this point, I'm so sure that these things actually exist with more or less the properties we would expect them to have, that I'm just gonna say, yes, that's what's going on, and I'm gonna move on with my life. I'm gonna to try to understand how these things appear in the universe, what role they have, and most importantly for someone like me, what they teach us about the fundamental laws of physics. Thanks, Sean. Roger, why do you believe in them so strongly? Well, well I don't, the fact that we can't see them doesn't seem to be much of a strong case. I mean, we can't see, uh, COVID-19 viruses, and we seem to believe in them too. At least we, need, we can if we have uh, appropriate devices, but we can't see them directly. And so many things we believe in, we don't see directly. The case of black holes, it goes back to Chandra Sekhar, who was a great astrophysicist, and when he was, I think, 19 years old, on the boat traveling to England, he did some calculations about white dwarf stars, and he found out that if they were more massive than a certain amount, they would collapse. And what happened to them, he, he, nobody really knew. And the potential that there might be something like a dark object which results from the collapse of a star has been there for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, it was in 1939 that Oppenheimer and a student of his, Snyder, uh, wrote a paper on a collapsing dust cloud. And they concluded that this would collapse down and make a, a singularity in the center. And a singularity would be a place where the density goes infinite and the equations go crazy. The Einstein's equations predict something which goes crazy in this way. Just in the uh, early 1960s or so, when, when quasars were seen, people were worried about these things because they seemed to be objects that were um, so massive and so relatively small that they seemed to be something that would be like uh, what Oppenheim and Snyder were talking about. But there was a big question there because uh, these assumptions that Oppenheim and Snyder had made assumed that this, the thing collapsing was exactly spherical and was made of material which had no pressure, dust as they called it. A lot of question about whether these things were real. I mean, if there's something irregular collapsing, maybe it would swish around and come out. At the time, this was in 1964 or so, um, I started thinking about these things and uh, there was a Russian group who seemed to prove that in the general case, you wouldn't get these singular states and maybe things would follow in and push around and come out again. But then I thought about this for a while and I was able to provide an argument, a proof, that in the general case, as long as it get beyond a certain point of no return, that they would necessarily collapse and you would necessarily get this singular state where the equations are crazy. It took many years, I think, before people were began to take this seriously. I think it was when the quasars were, were seen that people began to think maybe there was something there that could be what we now call a black hole. What is a black hole? Yeah, we got this uh, wonderful gift 100 years ago from Einstein in the, in the form of the general theory of relativity, right? Einstein had 10 years prior helped put the final touches on the special theory of relativity, which says the speed of light is the speed limit and things like that. And it was understood that you could actually think of that theory in terms of space-time being one thing rather than space and time being separate. So then 10 years later, Einstein comes along and says, yes, not only is space-time one thing, but it has a life of its own. It's curved, it's dynamical, it can respond to matter and energy. And it took a long time, as Roger indicates, for people to figure out that one possible thing that space-time can do is to curve in on itself so strongly that there can be regions of space-time from which nothing can escape. You could not leave this region unless you could travel faster than the speed of light, and that's what we now call a black hole. And people like Roger and Stephen Hawking showed that, in fact, this was very, very likely. It was not very hard to get this kind of thing. So really, a black hole is just a region of space-time where gravity has become so strong, whether because a star collapsed or many stars came together, that once you go in, you can never come out. Okay, and the wonderful thing about them, one of the many wonderful things about them is that there aren't that many. You know, if you look at planets or stars in the universe, there's this wonderful variety of things going on, whereas black holes settle down. And once you know how much mass it has and how fast it's spinning, 
you're basically done. That is the all you need to define what the state of the black hole is. Emily, I mean, what exactly is a black hole from the from the point of view of someone who's trying to understand how how galaxies and whole collections of galaxies actually form? From an astronomical perspective, at the very basic level, a black hole is very easy to understand, and Roger alluded to that. You know, we know a lot about... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.